Welcome to Hopkins on the Hill at home. Greetings, everyone. This is Congressman Sarbanes. I just wanted to take a quick minute and thank Hopkins for the On the Hill initiative that you launched back in 2017. It's made a real difference in kind of lifting up the work that Hopkins does and making sure that's on the radar screen of lawmakers. Uh, I like to think I have some insight into that because I'm a Baltimorean. I've seen the great work of Hopkins for many, many decades, and I evangelize about it to my colleagues. Uh, but it's great to have that opportunity on an annual basis to share the, the work that you're doing. I'm very privileged that there are two key assets of Johns Hopkins located in my district one is the Applied Physics Lab, which does amazing work across, again, so many different areas. I've, I've been out there a few times to APL. As you can imagine, I get pretty intimidated when I show up because there's just no way I'm going to keep pace with uh, what's being told to me about all of these breakthroughs. But it's, it's a pretty impressive operation, as you know. I also have Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. Uh, which delivers high quality care to many in the community and is also the site of some very important research that's going on uh, in our country. So there are many, many opportunities uh, to be impressed and at times awed by the good work that you do. I thank you for that, for the partnership with the federal government, which is now long standing. Um, thank you for that great work and congratulations. DART is the double asteroid redirection test. The Earth is hit by asteroids and pieces of asteroids all the time. Every year or so, we get hit by things maybe the size of a table. The kind of object that DART is going to visit is an object that's about the size of the Washington Monument. Those kinds of objects hit us every few thousand years, and they would cause severe damage to a, on a regional scale. We chose to do this demonstration at a binary asteroid. It's called Didymos. This is actually approximately the shape of the main asteroid. It's called Didymos A, and its moon, Didymos B. What DART will do is DART will hit the secondary. When it hits the moon, it will change the orbit period. And when it changes the orbit period, it affects the timing of when the moon moves in front of or behind the primary. Mostly what we're looking to do is change the speed of the incoming object by maybe a centimeter per second or so. So that's not very fast, but if you do it enough seconds in advance, you can cause it to miss the Earth entirely. DART is a, a part of a larger collaboration called AIDA, which pulls in all the experts of the world who can help their governments predict uh, and understand what it is that they can do and should do in the event that there was an incoming threat. The DART mission that APL is pulling together will be the first mission in that flight line. DART is the first mission to fly the next sea ion engine. It is the first mission to demonstrate smart navigation, which means we are going to be guiding ourselves into the asteroid autonomously. At about four hours out from impact, SmartNav is kicked in, and what it does is it uses the imagery from the optical payload, basically the camera that's on DART, and from the imagery, we are able to discern Didymos A from Didymos B. We have a targeting algorithm that differentiates the two, and we are aiming for Didymos B. 
The other part of this is the propulsion system that we're demonstrating. The Next C propulsion system is utilizing a new generation of gridded ion propulsion technology. And it's what we're using to allow us to get to the asteroid, um, but also allow us a flyby of an object prior to our actual encounter. For these vehicles to be able to supply the power for the electric propulsion engine, we needed higher power output. ROSA allows us to be able to have a very compact and light mass for launch and then deploy these really large arrays once we're out there in space. Our planetary launch window opens on June 15, 2021 and will impact the asteroid in 2022. We're very excited to be NASA's first planetary defense mission. Welcome to Hopkins on the Hill. A special thanks to Maryland's third Congressional District Representative, John Sarbanes, for his message. Today, we get to speak with Dr. Nancy Chabot. She is the Planetary Chief Scientist at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, or APL. She is also the Mission Coordination Lead on the Double Asteroid Reduction Test, or DART, mission. Among many other roles she plays at Hopkins, at Hopkins and at APL, she also has this amazing honor that asteroid 6899 is named Nancy Chabot in her honor. Nancy, welcome. Thanks, it's good to be here and talking about DART. Well, first of all, I just wanna clarify one thing. We were talking about Didymos B in that video, but you just let me know that the asteroid has a new name. Yeah, actually in June of 2020 last year, we were able to work with the IAU and get an official name for this object and it's now called Dimorphos. So the main asteroid is Didymos, meaning twin, and then Dimorphos, it means having two forms. And so it's gonna have a form before the impact and after DART's impact. Okay, so, so we have this target, but let's take one step back and just think about how this target is not a threat to the earth right now, which makes it a really good target, right? To demonstrate the ability to strike the asteroid and then change its path. In February, 2013, an asteroid strike in Chelyabinsk, Russia was the largest asteroid to hit the earth in the past 30 years. How frequently do asteroids hit the earth? Yeah, well, I mean, you're absolutely right. I like to say that T is for test. That's really important. This is not a threat to the earth. We're doing this test to see what we can do before we need it. But asteroids hit the earth all the time, just like you heard in that video. Um, so it's really a tricky question without talking about the size of the objects, right? I mean, small objects hit all the time. You see them burn up in the atmosphere, beautiful meteor showers, that kind of thing. Something that's maybe about uh, four meters hits every year. So we get one per year for that. Most of that just burns up in the atmosphere or makes meteorites, which are great scientific treasures that I also study and love. Um, but you know, bigger things also happen. Um, a lot of times when people think about asteroids hitting the earth, they think about the dinosaurs. That's uh, pretty much the first one that comes to mind. That's like 10 kilometers. So mm. huge difference that we're talking about here. We think that was more like a 10 kilometer object. Things like that hit every hundreds millions of years millions of years. Um, and uh, we're tracking all of those. We know where those asteroids are. There's none heading towards the Earth. But there's a whole lot of range between four meters and something that's uh, 10 kilometers. So I imagine then there's a whole lot of range of consequences when those asteroids strike the Earth. So for something like the size that, probably not the four meter that happens every year, but maybe the size more along the lines of what struck Chelyabinsk, what is kind of the, the consequence we're trying to avoid here? What, what damage can be done from a, a mid-sized asteroid? Yeah, Chelyabinsk base was still pretty small. It was about 20 meters or so. Um, and uh, and something like that, like we saw from a lot of those dash cam videos, you know, windows being blown out, uh, sonic booms, um, you know, luckily, uh, you know, not too many injuries, but it depends on where this would happen. It could still be a, a big threat. Something like the dart target, uh, Dimorphos is really the appropriate size because it's about 160 meters. And so these objects actually, um, we've only found about 40% of them, we think. So there's still a lot of them out there. We're not actively tracking. We don't know where they are. If something like that hit the earth, it would cause regional damage. We're talking tens to hundreds of kilometers. Obviously over a heavily populated area, this would be quite devastating. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense to be able to do something about that size in particular 
um, as well as taking steps to find all of these asteroids and track them and know where they are. The one kilometer and higher size, um, we are tracking over 90% of those asteroids right now. And uh, we know the Earth is safe from those extinction level events, but these other ones would be devastating on the state or small country level, potentially. Sure. So, so we have the target. When is the launch date? I mean, obviously you've got to get up there. So there'll be a launch date and an impact date of, of the, the asteroid itself. What are those two dates? Tell me about the timeline. Yeah, so we're gonna be ready to launch in November of this year. I mean, wow, well, that's creeping up on us, but we're, we're ready. <laughs> and, and so yeah, November of this year, the launch window opens and the DART kinetic impact into the asteroid will happen, um, depends on the specific launch date. So it'll either be late September or early October of 2022. Um, and this date is really one of the things that enables the DART mission because that's when these asteroids and the Earth are closest together. So they're still pretty far away, like 30 times farther away than the, than the moon. So far away by our standards, but from the telescopes that we're gonna use to see how much we've deflected the smaller moon around the main asteroid, we'll be able to use these things that are already here on the Earth, the telescopes that already exist to do that measurement to see how much we deflected in. And so that's why that, um, that impact date in the fall of 2022 is really key. And it's the closest that these asteroids and the earth come together until like the 2060s again. So it's really like this binary asteroid system at this time in 2022 is really a cost-effective and really kind of innovative way to do this first test in a very safe manner. That's a lot of pressure. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just it a is test. Literally, the stars <laughs> aligning. <laughs> um, but I think it. I think one thing that um, strikes me about uh, this mission is not just every single step, right, from launch to you know flying at such a pace to get there. Um, the part that kind of makes my heart stop is the shutdown of manual control before the impact, right? And, and explain to me why we need that and how smart technology is essentially gonna take over for the time immediately prior to the impact. Yeah, it's, a, it's really interesting because these asteroids are, are pretty close to each other, right? And you have this bigger asteroid and then the little moon that goes around it and the DART spacecraft is gonna be coming screaming in super fast, like, 15,000 miles per hour, right? And so it's not gonna be able to tell the difference between the main asteroid and the moon asteroid until the last hour of the mission, just because it's so far away and these objects are so close together and so small. And so it can't separate those, even with this great telescope that we have on board the spacecraft until the end. And so it's just very clear that the spacecraft has gotta be smart enough to go hit that moon. Um, and so it takes the images and, uh, and does that all on board uh, autonomously. And we've done a ton of testing on the ground um, because you know one of the things we don't know what this moon looks like. We don't know what its shape is. There's a lot of things. So the algorithm has to be really smart and that's, a, that's appropriately named SmartNav um, accordingly. But yeah, it needs to be really smart. And you know this is a really good thing for APL to be doing because we're really leveraging a lot of missile guidance expertise that we have in house that have been built up over the years to uh, enable this mission. So you'll be able to test a lot of these technologies and of course all the testing that leads up to you know the building of the smart technology and then putting it on on the the rocket and getting it out there right onto the onto the device. But here's here's my question. What are you going to be doing in that last tower when essentially you guys all of this work and you're just going to, I mean, do you pop popcorn? We'll be able to glue to our computer screens. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we will, uh, so we'll be streaming images back. So we'll actually get an image back every second. So we will, you know, be getting these real time feedback. It won't just be like we're sitting there waiting. Um, so we'll be streaming images back um, every second. Um, and eventually they're going to get closer and closer and closer until the images stop coming. Um, so, you know, we'll be, we'll be actively monitoring and, uh, and looking at this and everything, but the, the algorithm is very robust. And so um, it'll be a, an exciting moment to be able to share with the world, honestly, I think, as these images are coming back and uh, we see the first time that NASA is purposely crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid. And even though it's it's real time, it, it's probably like a minute or two delay, right? To get those. It's pretty close though, because we're um, doing this 2022 impact when the distance is minimized between the asteroids and the Earth. So it, it's a still a few seconds, but it's it's much much smaller than some of this delay that you hear about. Wow, that's amazing. 
So what if this project shows that there are limitations to the types of asteroid strikes that can be averted or redirected? For example, the size or the speed or the composition of the asteroid itself. What, what is the value of that information and what do you do with it? Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind that DART is just one part of a much larger planetary defense strategy. Um, if this was the only thing you were doing to protect the Earth from asteroids, this would not make a lot of sense. You need to do this as part of a much larger strategy. It's really important to find all the asteroids and then keep track of them. It's important to characterize what asteroids are like in all these different types so you know how to react differently. It's important to work internationally um, and to have these because this is a you know an international issue and international collaboration is really important um, and to constantly assess the situation. Then if you needed to, you could look at mitigation techniques and it's good to take this first step before you need it to demonstrate one that you might use. What DART really, um, a kinetic impactor like DART really relies on is warning time. This is not the sort of thing you wanna do at the last minute at the last second at the last year, you really kind of want to do it decades in advance because what we're talking about is not destroying the asteroid, just giving it a little tiny nudge that gives it a little tiny push and you do that many years in advance and then the earth and the asteroid are no longer on a collision course. How much a push you have to give depends on how big the asteroid is, but it also depends on your warning time. So warning time, the more warning time you can get for any of these, the easier they are to deal with. And that's probably where the true diversion lies between, for example, Star Wars and what you all are doing, right? It is not meant to destroy the asteroid, but really just to, to move it, um, which is a very gentle way to kind of keep us all living in, in some form of harmony with our universe, universe um, but still protect uh, the and more predictable in some ways, right? You can imagine that giving something a small push many years in advance, you know, if you start to destroy and disrupt objects, then there's all sorts of unknowns about exactly how that'll happen. And, you know, this wouldn't be your, your method of choice. And since this is the first test that we're doing at all to try to do this, it makes sense to try to do the preferred method, which is make sure you find all the asteroids early and then see if you can give them a small nudge out of the way if you need to. Um, you know, obviously right it wouldn't now. work for things that you found one day ahead of time, but that's, uh, that's why it's part of a much larger strategy. So the path is really to go for the gold. Here's, here's the best strategy we can think of that has this additional time cataloging of the asteroids and then hopefully a demonstration that we can nudge them out of the way. So there's not a collision. That's an interesting kind of strategy and of course involves the, the whole world. And in 2010, the National Academy of Sciences really did note that this was a whole world um, project, really planetary defense. And they said it was the highest priority to really protect the planet is to do these types of um, experiments and demonstrate a way to change the course of an asteroid through a kinetic impact study, which is what DART is, although it's a part of this bigger picture. So tell me why then, if that happened in 2010, 11 years, that's almost a decade, or more than a decade, why does it take 11 years to go from the National Academies of Sciences saying, hey, this is really important and we need to figure this out, to a launch date in November of 2021? What, what has to happen to, to literally get this project off the ground? Yeah, I mean, that 2010 report was uh, really brought a lot of people together in order to lay out the strategy to ask the questions that you were just asking right now about what would we do, what makes the most sense, what are the highest priorities, and that is where a mission like DART came out as the highest priority for a kinetic impact or mitigation mission in order to check at that. Um, and since then, there's been growing awareness about the importance of planetary defense. So. Uh, NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office was uh, established only in 2016. Um, and so this is, this is a big step forward. NASA was always uh, tracking the asteroids and trying to do what they could. Um, but you know, along with the establishment of this office, they also you know, have gotten more funding to enable these other activities and to develop their own flight line, which DART is the first member of. So, um, so that's really been enabling, I think, the, the foundation of that National Academies of Science report laid, laid things that have come since then with the Planetary Defense Coordination Office. And then in 2018, uh, the National Neo Preparedness and Action Plan was established. And that actually has a lot of government agencies other than NASA that are involved in contributing to that in, in a lot of different ways because uh, you know, there's certain parts that NASA does, but other parts that other government agencies do really well. And so I think there's just a, 
growing awareness and effort in this area. And it's great to be on DART trying to, you know, pioneer what we would do in this area. So it's interesting. I'm hearing, you know, universities like Johns Hopkins, right? I'm hearing um, different federal agencies with NASA being a, a primary player. I'm hearing about AIDA and all of these international groups that are coming together to also play different roles. I mean, is a project like this possible without federal funding? And is the U.S. government the only funder? Federal funding is really key to enable a project like this. This is a worldwide issue. It's a national issue. And uh, the federal funding is foundational to establishing programs like this. This is this is the sort of things that you want to be doing. Um, on DART, actually, we have a CubeSat that's contributed by the Italian Space Agency. And so that's another nation that's already contributing. Um, the European Space Agency is going to be sending a follow-on spacecraft that's going to orbit the Didymo system and get there in 20, 2026 in order to uh, gain even more information. And then combining DART with Para to make AIDA, this international collaboration, will be even bigger than the sum of their parts. So um, I think there is a lot of increase in this area and from governments, uh, our government and governments worldwide. So it sounds like there are a lot of team players worldwide. Who's on your team as the uh, mission coordination lead? I, I imagine you've got a lot of people working with you to get this together. So who is on your team for this project? I kind of, um, I always makes me cringe a little when, you, when I hear like my team, because I don't really think it's my team. We're a team. Uh, there are so many people at APL uh, right now. We have about 400 people actively working on DART um, at, at a whole bunch of different levels. And that's only at APL. That's not even with our partner institutions. We have um, scientists around the world, another 100 plus um, that are contributing as well there. So it, it really and that's one of the things actually I enjoy most about DART is that everybody contributes their expertise in order to make this whole thing come together. And there are so many different jobs in order to do that. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know, we've got, we've got a lot of people on our team. We've got a lot of different people on our team. It, it just, it, it feels like the future and we've, uh, you know, it's just, um, it's a joy to be part of. I mean, it is kind of one of our final frontiers, right? Space is our final frontier. I know it's cliche to say, but it, it's there. And kind of this, this composition of your team, can you talk a little bit about, you know, perhaps for some of our younger viewers out there about what it takes to kind of live this dream of, of working in space and on these missions that could protect the planet? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things to note is that they'll be like, what do you need to do to work on this mission? And it's like, I can't even answer that question. I mean, we have people with engineering degrees. We have, I have a PhD. You don't need a PhD. Most of the people on the team do not have PhDs. Uh, we have people who, this is the first thing they've done and they just recently got their degree. We have people who have been at APL twice as long as I have, which is a long time at this point, uh, you know, and they're, and they're working on DART and bringing all of that expertise together. So it, um, I think the take home message is if you're passionate about space, I mean, and we have people who don't have even traditional STEM degrees, if you will. I mean, you know, cause it takes a lot to manage this project. There's a lot of business behind it. There's, you know, there's a lot of communication. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of aspects that go into making this whole team work together. And, uh, and each part is critical in order for making this be a success. So I think, I think that's the take home role is that the most important thing is to do something that you're passionate about and then find your find your place because there are a ton of places. It's definitely not a like, this is what you need to do to work on a space mission. That's a, that's a fallacy for sure. So let's talk about a specific place for you. I imagine as November <laughs> keeps coming closer and closer, you're probably finding it a little bit more challenging to relax and recharge. What do you do in your day to day and what do you do to relax from kind of the, the excitement and intensity of, of this project? It is a lot, but I also, a lot of my role for the coordination lead will really even pick up at impact. Um, and so I think, you know, it, we've got other people on the team right now who are living and breathing DART more than I am. People who are in the clean room, you know, nearly every day, you know, out, out of the week, you know, putting the spacecraft together, uh, doing these integration and tests and, and all of these, you know, very hands-on jobs and, and going back and forth. And so it goes through phases, you know, where, 
right now they're living and breathing dart and that's going to be my life come around impact but um it's still stressful we're all stressed <laughs> on the team but things are going really well but at the same time uh there's just a lot to do so i don't know it's been a it's been a weird year so i'm not sure what i should say about <laughs> relaxing and uh and, and that kind of thing is taken on a different uh a different mindset than it has in other times. Um, I think. I think actually one of the things I've really appreciated in this last year is working on something like Dart, right? Because Dart makes you think about the future, right? And there's so many times this year that I've wanted to think beyond this year, and Dart has been like a way to do that and a way to know that hey, we're going to get through this, we're going to get out of this, we're going to look to the future, and and we're going to do these great things together that neither of any of us can accomplish on our own, you know? So, um, so for me, that's, that's actually been, been a lot of what's gotten me through this year. And, uh, but right now I'm really excited about the cicadas because I moved here 16 years ago and I know that anybody who's been through them says it's disgusting, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, you are a true scientist, Nancy. I love it. <laughs> I've been I... in the ground for 17 years. I mean, this is amazing. So. <laughs> Well, if you would be so kind, we would love to throw a couple of questions at you from the audience. And audience, if you have questions, please do go ahead and type them in at our website and we'll try and get to them. If we don't get to them today, we'll answer them on Twitter. So Nancy, are you ready? Sure. Okay, so uh, we have the first question. How was Dimorphos chosen for the target? You had mentioned it was, it seems like a good target, but what was that process to actually choose it? Yeah. So. It's interesting because one of the things that really enables this mission is the fact that it's this binary asteroid system, right? So you can imagine that the DART spacecraft's coming in 15,000 miles per hour, it's gonna crash into an asteroid. The spacecraft's totally destroyed, right? But you wanna know how much you deflected the asteroids. This is the most important part of the mission. Um, the DART spacecraft is not going to tell you it is no longer around. Um, the little Lichia cube Italian CubeSat is gonna take some great images of the ejecta that comes off of the asteroid, but then it's gonna go speeding on its way. It's not gonna stick around in order to tell you how much you've deflected this. So if you did this on an asteroid that wasn't a binary system, You'd either have to track it for a really long time to see how it changed going around the sun, or you'd need another spacecraft. And if you need another spacecraft, then all of a sudden that becomes a lot more costly, a lot more complicated. It, it you know, it just uh, greatly increases the test. Um, for a while, NASA was talking to ESA about that second spacecraft being there at the same time. Um, but then with this binary asteroid system, um, people realized, hey, we've been looking at this binary asteroid system for decades. And we know this little moon goes around this main asteroid every 11 hours and 55 minutes. It's like a little clock in space, 11 hours, 55 minutes, 11 hours, 55 minutes. And so we think we're going to change that by about 10 minutes and it's going to be closer to 11 hours and 45 minutes. We don't know for sure. That's why we have to do the test. Um, but it's going to be very easy to measure that with the Earth-based telescopes is the point. So that's really why this target was chosen because it has this close Earth pass in 2022 and we can use the telescopes that are here on the earth to see how much we deflected the asteroid. And it's a really unique um, opportunity because you can use the telescopes on the earth and it won't happen again until 2062, so. Wow, a lot of things to consider. Thanks, Elena, for that question. We have another one from Mike B. Will you be able to watch the launch? Is anyone covering the actual impact of the push on the uh, asteroid? So how, how, do we, how do we stay tuned, Nancy? Well, I mean, I think uh, NASA will probably uh, broadcast some sort of launch um, show. We're working with them right now. I mean, NASA uh, sort of takes the lead on a lot of those communications, but a lot of the other ones have been streamed on, on NASA TV and things like that. So um, so the launch uh, should be there. Um, and the impact, I imagine, will probably be doing something similar. We'll be getting these images back, like I said, um, from the asteroid. and. Uh, uh, openness and transparency is really important for planetary defense because this is an international issue. And so I think uh, even though we'll all be stressed out and a mess, <laughs> they'll probably be able to watch it along with us and experience the success. I mean, it's it's really going to be a pioneering moment, I think, for um, for humankind to take this first step. 
Amazing. So, so getting back to COVID for one second, you kind of touched on it for a minute, but we have a question from Kia who says, does, who asks, did COVID affect your team and how it works together? Seems like such difficult timing with the upcoming launch. So, I mean, COVID seemed to push back everything, right? So what has COVID had that impact here? So COVID was challenging um, in so many ways, right? I mean, from each of us personally to the work that we're trying to get done. Um, and you, there's just no way to minimize that or pretend like it's not. Um, and putting a spacecraft together already has certain procedures and processes on top of that. Um, so during this whole last year, actually, um, we put the COVID process and procedures on top of the spacecraft assembly process and procedures. And people have been going safely and uh, taking all sorts of precautions, but going into APL um, during this whole time in order to make this mission still go forward. Um, you know, weird schedules, uh, distancing, masks, I mean, all of these things in place, but still making progress. And um, I think that just shows that even if things changes, what brings you together is this project and people's belief in this project and that they're contributing to this project. And uh, it's definitely not the way that people would have laid out a year and a half ago, but um, we're on track for launch in November of 2021. And I think everybody on the team takes great pride in, in that and being ready to do that. Okay, last question from John. Is there a risk of deflecting or, or nudging the asteroid towards the earth? Yeah, well, that's another good reason to use this binary asteroid system to do this test, right? Because we're just changing how the moon goes around this main asteroid. Um, and we're actually going to hit it head on. And so we're going to send the moon a little bit closer to that main asteroid. Um, but this, this is also, you know, a good reason that, you know, this is, uh, and in fact, there's like a lot of math and a lot of paperwork so that I can confidently say, no, <laughs> we are not doing anything that's going to be there. Those are all filed paperwork and studies and things like that. But it also does, you know, make intuitive sense that, you know, if you're going to give something a small nudge, go ahead and do it in this way where you're um, changing the path of a moon around a larger asteroid. You're only changing it by 1% and you're going to change it. So it orbits a bit closer to the main asteroid than it used to. So um, no danger to the Earth. Well, Nancy, thank you so much. We have a couple extra questions that we are going to answer on Twitter, if you'd be so kind to chime in with us on Twitter yeah. um, to answer those questions. And next week, we'll be back. Uh, we want to thank Nancy for, for coming. We really wish you all the best as you prepare for this amazing challenge to meet this window this fall for the launch. And then in the upcoming year, as the impact date draws near, Thank you so much, Dr. Nancy Chabot, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been uh, really fun. Well, and next week, we'll continue to explore emerging technologies with the Hopkins team that's leading the way in protecting our troops and armed forces on the battlefield with the development of new and highly durable materials like indestructible batteries and wearable bulletproof technology. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Be well and bye for now.